All right, welcome to Shop Talks, a presentation by the Ink Kitchen, uh, which is an online source of information, inkkitchen.com. That's my thing. Impressions Magazine, Impressions puts the show on. Got our sponsors here, got our wonderful sponsors, Lane 7 in particular. And uh, we're going to talk about sales with my good friend here, Melissa Clark. One thing I'll say about this is uh, really try to have people up here that are not bullshitters and uh, are, uh, know what they're talking about. So we're not, we don't go the professional speaker route or uh, the consultant uh, getting business route. I try to have people that are actually out there doing the work and do it well. And Melissa is a really, really good salesperson and that's why she's here right now and you guys are lucky to have her here. Oh, that's way too nice and I definitely fall in the bullshit category because I'm in sales, so. Yeah, well that's for a purpose, that's different. <laughs> that's right. All right. All right, how do, you, how do you sell stuff? Well, there's a few, that's a really like, that's a hard question. Uh, first, you have to make sure you take away their pins. I think that's the way it works in Wolf Wall Street, right? Um, so, ask a better question. All right, that. so, um, what do you see that people do wrong out there trying to sell? How about that? What, that what's a common mistake that people do when they're trying to sell anything. I mean, you're trying to sell blanks, but we're all trying to sell our printing or shirts and printing. What's a, what's a big mistake that you see out there? Well, I also own my own print shop down in Austin with uh, my amazing fiance. And uh, one thing that we've noticed a lot is that people kind of chase after markets that they don't really know anything about, right? Uh, we're really heavy into music and merch and because he's a huge musician, uh, booze and all the fun stuff, all your favorite sins will do you in. Uh, that's kind of the market that we target because those are things that we identify with. And knowing that market and being authentic with your customer is super important because we all know when you're being super inauthentic, right? You can read it in people immediately. Rick is a great example of this, is super into the environment and doing things with farm aid. That's your passion and it shows. You're gonna increase your sales tenfold if you just focus on what you're passionate about and it will show and you will find other niches being authentic with who you are and what. Uh, it's funny, I'm thinking about a guy that um, we printed for He's really a boring guy, and he, his niche was insurance companies. <laughs> I don't know. It's probably his passion. <laughs> but it actually, it worked for him. He was like a steady, on, you know, unexcited guy, and he could relate to his customers. So, yeah, that, that works. So you'd be passionate. You're going to always do better if you care about, about it. Right? Yeah, and I, because you need to identify with your customer, ultimately, right? From the supplier end of my job, I understand what it's like to sit in your shoes and have a t-shirt that, why isn't this printing? Why isn't this taking the ink the right way? What the heck is going on? You know, what's the difference between DTG, DTF, all of the other acronyms that we want to talk about? That's my job to know and to tell you why my product does that. Your job to your customer is to say, hey, I see that you're doing X, Y, or Z here. Why don't you try this? I think you're going to have better results doing this and maybe on this product. All right, so, um, I mean, you recently went to work for a new company. Lane what's, 7. Yeah, so what's the, what's the process uh, when you're maybe starting a new market? So someone has a new machine or they just got a new product line that they had access to. What, what's the process of going about selling something that, that you're, when you're starting a, a new? Stocking. Um, so when you're prospecting a new customer, right, your job is before you go into that meeting or you are trying to approach a different customer or type of customer, it's your job to know everything you can about that customer before you go in and to talk to them. Oh yeah, the internet, right? Yeah, <laughs> Instagram, LinkedIn uh, are going to be your favorite places on the face, right? You'll find out everything they're doing. The other step that I think people really forget is know who their competition is, right? Mm. You may be dealing with a brewery, right? But they've got a brewery that's 10 doors down. 
What are they doing that's differentiating them from a merch standpoint? And how can you help? I think that's the biggest thing. Don't be a replacement, be a solution. Um, because you will find yourself exiting out of a customer relationship much faster if you're just a replacement. You need to be a true value add to your customer. I noticed one thing when you're selling us, like uh, you have, I, I guess what I would call the rules of engagement. Like you can only buy lane seven or you can only buy whatever brand it is under certain circumstances, right? Um, and then there's what we want and those aren't always together, but you seem like you like are good at matching that up. Like I, I don't really want to understand those rules and maybe the company doesn't care about me, but somehow you like seem to put that together. Yeah, so you're, you know, you connect what uh, your customer is telling you, right? Um, and you're saying, okay, you're looking for this, but you're, in your head, you're doing the check mark, right? All right, they want uh, a tri blend, they want uh, full color print, but they want it to have no hand, but they also want puff print, right? One of these things is not going to happen. Um, so you kind of you listen for all of those things and you figure out, okay, I, I understand the direction that you're headed and going for that and just making sure that you're coming up with a realistic solution that makes your life as easy as possible. It's a lot easier than trying to figure it out on the printing end, actually. Customer service and sales, I always say, solve a lot of uh, technical issues. <laughs> yes. Um, I, the number of uh, crazy things that y'all have... Uh, sent to me along my journey is pretty hysterical, but uh, kudos to you guys. So do you have like a bag of tricks in a way, like, like, like things that you think really help you sell that would relate, people could relate to? Uh, I've been told more than once, uh, me personally, I am unafraid to ask for business. Uh, and I'm not afraid to approach people that I shouldn't necessarily talk to. Uh, I will find a way to get into a door, even if they don't want me there. And then, just because of my amazing personality, <laughs> I will get there somehow. Uh, but in all honesty, everyone puts their pants on one leg at a time. Uh, so you can't be afraid to talk to people. There's been people that have really intimidated me throughout my career. Um, my favorite story, is a few years ago, I went into a meeting. It was uh, with a big box retailer, and I was super intimidated. And I was like, okay, all of my stuff is way too expensive. This meeting is a total waste of my time. I go in, I have the meeting, I'm like, whatever, I'm gonna throw this away. I sit down, they take two seconds, and they're like, we wanna add your entire collection to our assortment to 3,500 doors of this store. And I was like, huh? <laughs> One more time? What did you say? She said, all of it. We need all of it right now. I was like, uh, I don't have the manufacturing capabilities to do that, but let's figure it out. But what it taught me in that moment is you never know when they're going to say yes and just be prepared for it. So, and whatever you went in there thinking, I thought, okay, I might get one thing and I got 20, right? Don't be afraid, don't leave anything off the table. They're gonna come to you for more than you may have expected or asked for to begin with. You seem like you're really motivated by a challenge. I think that's true of a lot of uh, salespeople. And I, I just, I've heard over the years, like you'll say somebody expected this and I beat it. Like, so I know they say that salespeople like golf because you keep score. Like you definitely seem to keep score in your head about things like that. Is that a good motivator? Yeah, I work in a little bit of a different way though. I don't like it when people know I'm competing with them. If they know I'm competing with them, it takes all the fun out of it for me. Um, but that's my own. That seems more like you compete with a number than a person. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're like, oh, you think I can't sell this much? I'm going to sell this much. Yes, but I, the, I think that the other piece of that is like in both sides of with Lane 7 and within our own business, I'm always looking at what my competitors are doing, right, and the numbers that they're putting up, and that's the number that I'm really chasing. There are programs and opportunities that I want, and I know how I'm going to have to get there and what path I need to take. Um, so do you have any other tricks of the trade that you... Uh 
that you use? Uh, that's a whole different conversation. Um, I think be, I want to go back to the be authentic piece because okay. I think yeah. it's and sitting down and having a conversation with your customer. So you go in and you're, you say, tell me about what you're doing. Even though at this point you should already know everything about your customer, what they're doing and what their competition is doing. Let them talk to you. Right, if you come into my booth and we start engaging into a conversation today, I'm gonna to ask you eventually, what do you do? Who's your customer base? I generally already know because of where we're at. Um, things I just know, but you might tell me something along the way that you're having an issue with that I'll be, right now, everyone's looking for inventory, right? So I know those pressure points and I know how to answer that. So that is your job to kind of come in and say, Oh, I noticed, you know, online with, you know, you're doing this, this, and this. Have you had issues, kind of bring some of those issues to light, right? They're having trouble sourcing or, oh, well, have you tried this? Because you know your competition's only sourcing from X, Y, or Z. You can bring in other vendors like Lane 7, got to do the prop there. Um, so doing it that way, I think just, and then knowing what their competition is doing and pointing that out to them in a very gentle way of saying, hey, you know, I noticed that X, Y, and Z company is doing, they gave away rulers for their last uh, big giveaway. Have you done anything like that? So then you're kind of bringing it into a different fold for them and making them relook at their merch program. And then the one thing that you've just done is become a value add. You understand their market. You understand what their customer is trying to gravitate towards and ultimately what they're trying to do with their merch. You know, I think everybody's really busy too, so your approach works that way. I mean, if you listen and then you only give your sales pitch that fits what their need is, you're not wasting the time. When someone wants to, like, can I bring in all everything that we sell and show you the whole thing and blah, 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 it's like, no, sorry. A canned pitch is the worst pitch. Right. <laughs> so, well, it's two one way, you know? It seems like when you sell, you're more like a two way street. It should absolutely be a conversation. All right, should we do questions or you want to yeah. say more first? Questions are All right. perfect. Who wants to uh, know something about sales? Y'all are experts, I like it. Oh yeah, all experts. How many of you are the only salesperson for your business? It's hard. Fun, huh? <laughs> How about motivation? Uh, like, how do, you, how do you stay motivated? Because you really do have to be on when you're uh, doing sales, right? Everybody relate to that? Yeah. You can't be, like, asleep. May like, so how do, you, how do you stay motivated? And do you have, like, a schedule or something that keeps you going? Because it's, it's not always easy to be on. Uh, COVID was hard. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but bourbon and queso, uh, not big motivators. <laughs> Um, but I think kind of what I've learned over the last two and a half years is that my family is a huge motivation in looking at my son every day and being like, this baseball and football equipment's not cheap. Um, so there's that fundamental level. There's also, I want to take my business and my career in a certain direction. Um, and the relationships I've built with people in this industry and with my customers really starts to keep you motivated in what you want to do and how you want to evolve those relationships and your own self because that's what you're trying to do. Yeah, we had Stan Banks talk yesterday. He has like keeps a notebook and the first page is like his, his ultimate goal. Yes. Like, you know, where he wants to be, what he wants to make for money. And he that's like front and center. It's like right in the front of this book that he carries around with him. So it's like something like that. You don't, if you don't have a book, maybe you have it in the front of your head, at least what direction you're headed. Yeah. It, up, onward and upward, don't look back. Uh, I think for me, my genuine motivation is just finding, uh, to make a lot of money, I know uh, Tim would appreciate that, uh, so he can retire, I think. Uh, and then, uh, but really to fundamentally make really great relationships and friendships like we have, that uh, Rick's been a huge motivator for me uh, in my career and support and an ally. Um, it makes me get up every day and go to work and when it's really hard. Question? Yeah. 
Okay, so the question is, uh, how did, when you go to a bigger fish, how do you get in there other than uh, look online for who that might be that lets you in? So uh, someone I, I did a panel with a while back, so this is not my idea. Um, There's no new ideas anyway. Go I ahead. I know, but uh, what, LinkedIn for sure should be your first stop. If you're not on LinkedIn and you know, really figuring out what the landscape of that community is like, because that will tell you everyone you need to know. Um, so from there, what they were doing is they were sending merch every month or every six months, right? Like, it's a long-term game. It's not a short-term. Because you knew eventually that person is going to have a need that only I can fulfill. Or I'm just going to be annoying enough that they're finally going to pick up the phone and let me in for a meeting. And honestly, I took that and I was like, I ran with it. And there are people that I call once a week, once a month, because I want their business. Eventually, they're going to pick up the phone <laughs> um, because they're just sick of me calling. So, uh, but find creative ways to try to engage that customer. But what I loved about her, she's like, she just kind of figured out oh, their birthday's right around this time, it looks like, right? So she would send them a birthday present. And then it became more personal. And then she, she said, the longest one took me 20 years. And I was like, that is a hell of a lot of dedication. Wow. Uh, but she's like, I wanted that customer that bad. And so, uh, but then she's like, once that customer was mine, even through COVID, loyalty abound. And so I think that's, really be annoying you know persistence is actually in there too and we analyzed like our biggest customers where they came from it was uh almost always at least three years from the first contact till we got a lot of business and i mean no one's going to just give you a bunch of business that's not going to happen usually you earn it so you know after you break down the door you also have to earn the rest of it no one's going to just throw it all in your face it's not going to happen right th yeah we haven't talked about that is retaining customers right uh that's really, that's the hardest part. Getting in the door will feel easy once you're at the retentions phase um, because stuff's going to come up. There's going to be a problem. There's going to be a shirt somewhere. It will be the one shirt, right, that has some screw up on it that the owner's going to get. That's inevitably how it happens and how to navigate that. And my biggest piece of advice to you is get ahead of it. Do not avoid it. I avoid conflict like there is no tomorrow. But I know if you come to me and say there's an issue, that I have to address it right then because the longer you let, her, let that fester, it will become way worse and you will say goodbye to all of that business. So I would say know. the most loyal customers I have, we have had some huge problem with and we resolved it, that nothing cements a relationship like uh, them knowing that no matter what goes wrong, you're going to make it right. Yep. And Cause, if you, cause something always goes wrong and it's even better if you tell them there's a problem yeah because if you're upfront about it you're going to get a lot more grace and forgiveness than if you ask for it later um other questions how about a worst experience that you might have learned from like where your sales pitch fell on deaf ears and you blew it worst even just some bad, like where you feel like, oh man, I didn't do what I should yeah, have done. Yeah, so uh, three years ago, four, I was meeting with the Air Force and I was sent in uh, to go talk about their uniform program. And I think that this is going to be with two people uh, that do like promotional stuff for the military. I walk in and I walk through the office, and I, at that point I was working for a domestic manufacturer. I walk in and I see all sewing machines, cutting machines, plotters. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not the person for this meeting. I walk in, there's 25 people in the room, all of them very technical fabric, sewers, <laughs> like the whole- Wait, the this whole is a, a nightmare you had or this actually happened? This actually happens. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> And the night before, uh, my boss was kind of coaching me through it and like what he wanted me to touch on for this meeting. And I just walk in and I'm like, 
whatever meeting I thought I was having, it's not here. <laughs> um, and the people that I need to meet with are not in this room. Uh, and so we started talking and they very clearly sussed out in about 30 seconds, you don't know anything. Um, like, yep, that's 100% true. <laughs> Uh, anything you need to know in terms of sewing, uh, burst tests, and all that, out of my league. So then, uh, the way I did salvage, salvage ah. this uh, and earned an Air Force uniform contract out of this. But uh, in my bag of tricks, I swear to God, I had my samples sitting next to me. At that point, I had velour, like a tracksuit and <laughs> oh, women's tracksuit cool. and velour. Yeah, uh, I pulled that out. I was like, well, I don't, I don't have any idea what you guys need or how to make it, but I have velour. Uh, and because of that, because of my honesty in that situation, I was granted the bid uh, for the Air Force. <laughs> I still don't know how. All but, right. Uh, they laughed at me, and I was like, ah. Uh. But hey, you can see sewing detail. You can see... Then I switched it, right? You can see detail. You can see what's happening in our factory at this skill set. And then it, it started to evolve. I was still totally 100% out of my league. Should have never have been there. But you pivot. Pivot. I'll remember that. Pivot. Yeah, pivot. Um, other questions? Let's wait a second, see if any developed. Any questions? No? This is a great question. Uh, this is a good one. All right, so the question is, and this is a great question, is uh, she sells uh, to PTOs and uh, service clubs, and the um, people that are doing the buying don't necessarily stay there. They're, they might go in a year, they might go in three or four years, but they don't stay forever. So how do you maintain that business when the buyers change, basically? Yeah, so then it just becomes, you just uh, have to start kind of from the beginning, unfortunately, that you have to build a new rapport with that person. I think the advantage in that is you can say, hey, this is what we've done previously. I'm super excited to work with you. I think this is gonna be an amazing relationship. You know. And I would list out before they find out, right, specifically with like the PTO, here's some of the struggles we've had in the past. Here's what I propose oh. to fix this, right? And here's how I would like to work with you going forward. Um, because then you're setting out on a, you're helping that they're gonna think that you're looking out for them, but you're really trying to make your life easier. Um, so uh, kind of approach it from that of, you know, this is, we wanna continue this, this is how We've done it. Here's how we can improve the process. And here's some ideas that I was thinking about might work for you guys going forward that maybe the other person was a little cold to. You know, I used to be scared shitless of that. Like, I have some really big customers, and the buyer would leave, and I'm like, oh, my God, we're going to lose that customer. And um, I think one thing that has worked really well is I approach that person, and a lot of times they don't know what they're doing. And... I can be a resource. So there's a major beer company. I've been there as long as every single person that works there except the owner. And the new people come in, they don't know what they're doing. So I honestly offer to help them. I have a reputation for doing that. So if they check me out, and I'm a resource. So I, they already know I don't take advantage. Um, my friend that uh, always says, uh, what's he say? Pigs, pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered. So I don't take advantage of situation of a new buyer and, and jacking the price or something. And I'm a resource for them. And I think that a lot of times, maybe the person doing the PTO ordering doesn't want to do it. Like, right? And you're like, well, here's what I've done in the past to help the buyer. Because the buyer might have quit without even telling them anything, right? And then I have a friend that sells to those industries like you. He prints his own boxes, so the boxes are hanging around. At least so the buyer leaves, they know where they came from before. So there's always some crap left from the year before, and they're in his boxes. So um, I think that's a good one, too. That's a good trick. 
the only thing I would add to that is that sales gets the name sales rep or anything if gets a really, really bad rap, right? Like, ooh, salesperson. Mm, I don't even like salespeople and I am one. Uh, so, uh, but I think it's because you have to view yourself as the expert, as the resource. You, you're there to fix a problem. They are off, you know, selling refrigerators. Your job is to help them do this piece of it and own it. Um, the more that you help in that, it's going to help those transitions by far. All right, other questions? Who wants to know how to sell to somebody? We'll help you. What do you want to sell? What do you, what do, you do anyway? What's your, what's your business? You a screen printer? What size? Autos? One auto, one manual, one embroidery. I think that's pretty common. So one thing that I ask a lot of people is like, what's your mix of customers? I think in COVID, this has become even more important and maybe get out of your comfort zone a little. I mean, you always want to go what you're passionate about, but you know, someone's like, uh, like I have friends that just do bands. Oh my God, they all go on tour at once and you can't freaking do it. There's no chance. So like, a product mix, like we have a really big customer and I think uh, my manager's on the same page as I am and they just said they're gonna expand. They're already my biggest. And that's actually a warning sign, like, cause if you get all in with just one customer, it can take you far, but you have to have something else going on. So, so do you have a variety of customers? So you're more business to business, okay. And, uh, we do have team there, we do small amounts of that, but I don't find that's a great business. Yeah, well, if it's a bad business, don't keep it just to have business. That would be my other advice. If it's the wrong business for you, don't do it. What, what you just said, I think, is a really important point of diversifying. Don't let one customer be 80% of your business. I've seen so many shops just go under because their customer decided to take their business in a different direction and or they somehow got squeezed out of something, uh, which is tragic. But I think div diversifying your customer base, so right, like you've got a lot of interest in your life, grab a hold of those, right? Even if it's a, I'm a Pinterest fanatic, so like home stuff, you know, like I wanna work with those types of people because I find what they do fascinating. Uh, so having different niches that you work in and just think about it as your personality how i you are all a component of a million different things right so grab a hold of some of those or if there's something you want to learn about i find that a great way to get in with people is saying okay i love i love what you're doing i know nothing about it i want to learn from you and i want to work with you so then it becomes more of a, a relationship yeah, the PTO example is a good one. Like, really, any business can have turnover in the buyers. And you do have to be ready for it. I mean, sometimes a buyer will come in, and they will have their own sources. And that's, that's even tougher. And you better be ready for it. And that's why you can't have all your eggs in one basket. Uh, yeah, that's... You're going to lose some customers. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I guess, the other thing about... If you can't deal with failure, you can't be a salesperson. I've never failed. <laughs> Well, that would be a definition thing then, wouldn't it? Um, you know what I mean? It's going to be, I don't know, I get, maybe I think I'm a good salesperson partly because I played a lot of baseball, like played until I was 60, and I was a really good hitter. And if you're a really good hitter, if you, you know, don't get a hit 70% of the time, you're a really good hitter. <laughs> like you got to be uh, ready for some failure. And... Um, so how many of you are still scared of the sales process because it's not what you wanted to be doing? <laughs> They're all owners. <laughs> it's terrifying because you're putting yourself out there. And, but I want you to know, because I've been on both sides of it, you're okay, right? And there is no one way to do this. But the one thing I can tell you that most salespeople forget to do we didn't talk enough about this. Follow up. 
Say what you're going to do and do it immediately. Do not put it off. Don't because you will forget and then under promise and way over deliver, right? So because otherwise you are just digging a hole from the outset with that customer, right? You need to put your best foot forward. And I, all the time, even in this industry on my side, reps die all the time because they don't follow up. So do it all the time, in your car, as soon as you're done with that meeting, write that thank you email, immediately follow up uh, because it will become your to-do list later and it will help immediately. They're like, oh my God, they really loved us. You could have hated the meeting, thought it went horribly, but they may have a completely different perception of what happened in that meeting. You're okay. Actually, you know, I am also get sold to, so I guess I learned about sales because I'm sold to a lot. We have a big enough business that people try to sell to us, people like you. And so even if people kind of blow it, I don't know, they walked in and they shouldn't have or whatever, you can put a spin on it later. You know, someone will say, you know what, I, I realize I shouldn't have walked in like that and I took too much of your time, I'm really sorry, but here's like a couple of very brief things I wanted to say. And it, someone that at least acknowledges that, I think it works way better if they're honest and that they followed up. Follow-up's huge, right? When you're ordering from somebody, you wanna know that when you need it, they're gonna respond. So it is a test. I feel like he might be yelling at me, I don't know. No, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> But no, you're actually good at follow-up, and not everybody is, and I think that is uh, underappreciated. You kind of, I think your mind goes to that, the, how's the meeting start, and how's the meeting go, but the follow-up to the meeting is probably, uh, if not as important, more, yeah. might be even more important. And the other thing, that feeling of dying on the vine when you're sitting in a meeting and you're just like, can I get out of this, like, right now, uh, and it's still going, or the awkward moments, live, breathe through it. It's going to be okay. And you will take that moment and you will relive it and you will learn how to navigate your way out of it the next time it happens. Um, Cause there's been uncomfortable moments in meetings, even for me. Uh, and I thrive in uncomfortableness. Um, you're going to figure so you must it. love this. <laughs> See, at the, at the beginning I was nervous. Now you can't get me to shut up. See, that's how this works. But, uh, really stay in that uncomfort because that's when something magical is happening, even if it really is painful. Uh, or just admit in your meeting, like, I'm super nervous. I've done that. Uh, and it goes a long way. I mean, put all your cards on the table if you have to. I actually uh, have come to embrace uncomfortable silences sometimes. That you just have to wait one more tick than you're comfortable with and the person will tell you something. Like, it's not necessarily that it's all gone to hell. They might be thinking, who knows, but, you know, just bring a little out more the silence isn't that terrible. Just bring out the velour, it's gonna be fine. <laughs> yeah, bring out the velour, all right. Um, other questions about selling? How do I sell you, Rick? <laughs> I'm, I think I'm good. Um, all right, so you know what? There's always shy people. So uh, we will stop, and you will stay here, please. Yes. Uh, and uh, they can come up to you and ask their questions in their shy way. How's that? I love it. All right, so how about a hand for Melissa Clark? And Rick? I want to thank our sponsors, Alpha Broder, Los Angeles Apparel, Hirsch, Omniprint, NASDAQ, and uh, what's that other one up there? Lane 7. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Impressions, and I'm from the Ink Kitchen. Check it out. Check out the posters we're printing back there. You got the uh, Print Monkey back there, Brian printing uh, Lucy. Hear the story of Lucy. And, uh, well, look, showing a poster. Love Check it, it out. Uh, we got shirts for Ukrainian humanitarian aid. It's really a good cause, and um, thank you for coming. Thanks, y'all.